Hey, Intern Army, Dr. Chris Rainer, orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine physician. And today, I'm reacting to WWE injuries. So we've reacted to a lot of sports so far. Football, soccer, hockey, baseball, UFC, and in rugby. And in the comments, all these they said, Dr. Chris, you gotta do WWE. Well, today is your lucky day, because today I'm reacting to WWE injuries. Mr. Sarcasm, yeah, I don't care. If yeah, Elizabeth. For those of you who know wrestling, you'll know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I got it. Now, before we get started, I gotta tell you, I used to watch wrestling a lot when I was younger. I have not watched wrestling in a long, long time. Prior to this, I had not seen a lot of these matches before. In order to have any idea of what I was talking about, I had reviewed them, and I had to kind of look up what had happened to them because it was not really clear what injuries they had suffered. But I'm gonna try to explain to you how I think it is that they suffered whatever injury that has occurred. Before we get started, I gotta say, injury footage will be shown. If you wanna step away now, go watch one of my other videos, like when I operate on an orange. Kind of go on the edge and then you gotta make a whole bunch of passes. That's safe. So this first injury involves Joey Mercury. Double Boom! Oh, 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 my Anytime you see the ladder out, somebody's getting messed up. I'm not exactly sure what this move is called. I think it's called the double slobber knocker or something like that. Two guys are getting hit with the legs of the ladder. We see these two guys here getting set up to get hit by the ladder. Lo and behold, one guy, Joey Mercury, actually gets bashed in the face by the foot of the ladder. He is not in good shape. When we see him down on the ground, his face is messed up. And even on the slow wall, it's difficult for us to say exactly where the ladder hit him. But based on the facial lacerations that he has and the blood coming out of his nose, I think it's safe to assume that he got smashed directly on the nose or just underneath it. And when we look this up afterwards, he did indeed suffer fractures of his nasal bones. So he broke his nose there. If this is something that is not too common, in other words, he's broken it, but not into too many pieces, he should be able to have a closed reduction. Closed reduction means that we are going to basically put the bones in place without opening the skin. Uh, and then he'll have his nose splinted uh, temporarily until the bones heal, which will usually occur in about six to eight weeks. Okay, so let's move on to number two. This injury involves Triple H. Another wrestler throwing him out of the ring. And you can see just as he starts to traverse the ropes, as he's going out of the ring, he kind of gets caught up with his right arm. His right arm goes back behind his head as his body is arched and he's falling out. Most of these wrestlers are really, really big guys and they're really quite muscular. Most of them are probably not that flexible. If he suddenly gets thrown into a position where his arm is extended and he has now gone to the maximum amount of forward elevation that his muscles that are on the front, his anterior musculature can accommodate, the muscle that's holding it in place something bad is gonna happen. Basically, the mechanism is that his arm went behind his head in too quick or too sudden a fashion. The tightness of his muscle did not allow the arm to do so. That muscle gives up and then he suffered a pectoralis uh, muscle rupture. And usually that occurs at the level of the tendon where it attaches into the bone, but sometimes it can come, occur in the muscle belly itself. Now, obviously, it, in the case of a rupture, or in other words, when the muscle has been torn um, at its insertion or at some other location, we'll need to repair that and uh, in an operative manner. In this particular case, when you look at the picture that Triple H put up on Instagram after, you can see that his whole chest and his arm are bruised. And this gives you a clue as to what the injury is. Even though I know already that it was a pectoralis rupture, this, the pattern of the bruising lets you know that something that has occurred in this area, which involves not only the chest, but also the upper arm, is the culprit of the, the bleeding that has occurred underneath the skin. And we expect it to be quite extensive based on the level of bruising that he has. And this was confirmed after when we looked up the news information about the injury that he'd suffered. I think Triple H hurt his ribs when he came over the top. 
Okay, so for this next one, this one involves Jeff Hardy. And so this is obviously a cage match. Boom! Most of the stunts that they do in wrestling are usually pretty scripted and they are designed in such a way that although they look very spectacular, the chance for injury has been mitigated or lowered by some particular arrangement such that the forces are, are dissipated or reduced when they smash into each other or smash into the ground or smash into some type, particular type of apparatus. Here we see that um, when he lands on the table, which I think was the thing that was supposed to be cushioning his blow, only his upper body lands on the table. So although we want to dissipate the force over a large area, he was unable to do so and he has taken the brunt of his force with um, his upper body. Basically, we have a blunt trauma to the upper body or to the thorax. With the angle that we have of the camera, it's difficult to say exactly what did hit, hit first, but I think his arm hit first, then his upper body, and his head with his head and neck were just kind of flapping in the breeze. When you have a blunt trauma to the chest, there is quite a significant chance of injuring internal organs, such as your lungs, be your heart itself, the liver on your right hand side, or it could be the spleen on your left hand side. So any one of these organs can be injured by a blunt trauma to the chest and a sudden stop. Kind of the same thing as being in a car accident where you are moving at speed and then you hit a fixed object. Everything inside keeps moving for a split second and then it is suddenly stopped when it hits against the cage. So the media information after um, shows that uh, Jeff Hardy was throwing up blood in the hospital after his 20 foot fall. Something internally has been injured. They didn't say specifically what his injuries were, but I would guess that he had suffered either a pulmonary contusion, uh, which is a bruise to the lungs, or a pneumothorax, which means that there's actually a hole in the lungs. Air um, from within the lungs has escaped outside of the lungs, but inside of the chest cavity. And so that's also a problem because sometimes that can lead to a collapsed lung or respiratory compromise. He could have had either of those things, but certainly he was coughing up blood and that's not a good thing. Okay, so now we're gonna go back in time a little bit because this is from an older wrestler. And this one involves Sid Vicious. But we believe you should incorporate more aerial So Sid Vicious is uh, in this match here. Boom! That's pretty much plain to see. I can see that, you can see that. Sid Vicious up on top. Look at the left foot. The milkman can see that, and your neighbors next door can see what happened here. He jumps off the rope. He is going to jump onto uh, his opponent. As he does so, he lands on his one leg and a bit off balance. Because he is landing off balance, he has now introduced a an element of rotation because his foot is going to land and then his body is going to rotate around the foot and that's going to add a portional force or a force that is applied in rotation to the bone. As I've said it before, bones are really great in compression but they absolutely suck in rotation. Sid Vicious proves to us exactly why that is. As he lands, his leg gives up the ghost, boom. That is look, so look, at difficult. look at the left. He suffers a tibia fracture uh, at about the, the level of the mid shaft. I would venture to say, even though I can't see this, just because of the force that he is jumping with, obviously Sid Vicious is a, is a big man. I would say he's um, north of 250 pounds. Because he is such a big guy and he has landed with force, this is going to be an open fracture. The bone coming out through the skin, compound fracture of the tibial shaft until proven otherwise. This is not only a tibia fracture, but this is a fibula fracture at the same level. This is gonna require open reduction internal fixation. That means we're gonna cut the skin. So we're gonna make an incision at the level of the knee. We're gonna drill a hole and we're gonna place a titanium rod down through the shaft, right down to the ankle. And then we're going to straighten out the leg and then we're going to lock that nail at the top and at the bottom so that we have no more rotation and so that the, the whole construct can remain stable. An open injury, and especially if it's quite severe and has a lot of comminution or a lot of fragments, can take upwards of nine to 12 months to heal. And that is really 
pretty ugly. Uh, media release uh, after this said that both of his bones were protruding from the skin. This was definitely not part of the show. This is when uh, wrestling goes wrong. Sid Vicious up on top. Oh, that is look, so look at difficult. The, look, look at the left foot. Oh, Another angle. Already so many times and it's... This is another old time match here. This one involves Mick Foley. And Mick Foley has played a number of different wrestling characters over the years. So this is one when he was playing the role of a character called Cactus Jack. Whoa. Okay. So basically he gets thrown over the top rope. Oh my God. But as he does so, the top two ropes intertwine with one another except that when they do that, his head is in between. The referee kind of puts his hands on the ropes and as Mick finally releases himself, the ropes fly up quite quickly and we don't really see anything here, but he falls to the ground and we can see the uh, aftermath of this in the picture which they put on social media. He's got no ear left on the right hand side. Obviously, your ear is an appendage which hangs off the side of your head. You can imagine that if you take a rope and put it under tension and scrub it up the side of your head really, really quickly, anything that is hanging off the side of your head that is in the way of that rope is gonna get ripped off. If you look at the media coverage afterwards, it says that, you know, he was quite close to dying. This is a situation that could have ended up quite differently if they were not able to get him free from the ropes. He didn't die, but it did cost him an ear. If you're a plastic surgeon watching this video, maybe you could say in the comments whether that would be possible to reattach. He lost his ear while wrestling, and I'm not sure if he got it back. Mick Foley has played a number of different characters. In this next video, he's playing another character called Mankind. He's in a match here with, I believe this is The Undertaker, and this is another cage match. When I was young and my mother used to watch wrestling, cage match was always the one that we wanted to watch because that's basically granddaddy of all matches. You're locked in a cage, you can't go anywhere, and two men enter, one man leaves. The Undertaker throws Mick Foley off the top of the cage onto the ground. Anytime they're doing these kinds of things, they never throw them directly onto the ground because they need to throw them onto something that is going to absorb the impacts. Anyway, The Undertaker throws Mick Foley off the top of the cage, boom, down onto these tables from a height of 20 plus feet. And then when Foley's big 300 pound body starts going through the air, you know. A few inches later. We can see that he's still able to get up after this. My guy is heading back onto the cage. As if being thrown from a height of 20 something feet onto a table wasn't enough, he goes back for more. Please sir, I want some more. The Undertaker then throws him through the top of the cage into the ring directly onto his back. He has people attending to him in the ring because that dude is messed up. I, I can't tell you specifically what he had happen just by looking at it. This could involve the lungs, the heart, the liver, which is on the right hand side, or the spleen. Something's gotta happen to either his arm or his shoulder onto that side. It could also involve some of the hollow viscous organs, and so that includes the esophagus, the intestines, but I can see in the media release after. So not only did he suffer concussion, but his additional list of injuries included a dislocated left shoulder, bruised ribs, internal bleeding, numerous puncture wounds from the thumbtacks, and a dislocated jaw. But yeah, that's just craziness. All right, so this next clip is of uh, Triple H. So he throws uh, another wrestler out of the ring. It looks like he's coming to the rescue of his partner. And as he lunges forward, his left leg kind of gives out. This looks like a quad tendon rupture. Felt like I'd been shot in the thigh. We so see a clip of him in the doctor's right. office. We can see him pointing to his quadricep right at the level just above his knee. It just popped. Just popped and went down. If you're not familiar with anatomy, the quadricep, which is a group of four muscles, they're on the front of your thigh. All of those muscles come together to attach into the top of the kneecap. 
through a tendon, which is called the quadricep tendon. You can suffer an injury in the quadricep muscle itself further up, but on occasion, you can suffer an injury in the quadricep tendon, and that tendon can tear off of the bone so that you have a quadricep tendon rupture. Once you have that, your ability to straighten your leg is no longer effective. And that speaks to the reason why as he lunged forward, he just kind of fell to the ground. His quadricep was no longer intact. The thing that allows you to extend your leg is no longer functional. So this is not something that is going to heal conservatively or without surgery. Uh, when we go back to the office footage, we can see one of the uh, most famous orthopedic surgeons in um, North America, Dr. James Andrews, is here explaining to him what has happened and what needs to be done. And when they show you the x-ray, of his knee you can't really see much from the x-ray here uh, because generally this is something that is a soft tissue injury but we can see that there's no fractures the rest of the joint remains good you have to look at the mri image which they show afterwards which then shows you that there is a significant amount of edema or activity on the film just where the quadricep tendon would insert into the patella so we know that he suffered an injury there and also not only is there uh, edema or an increase in signal there but there's a big gap there should be a gap there and that gap tells you the tendon that used to live down here has now decided to relocate in another time zone and that's always a bad thing because then your extensor mechanism doesn't work and you can't walk and you can't, obviously if you can't walk you can't wrestle that needs to be fixed and to fix that uh, there are a number of different ways to fix that two most common ways are either number one we're going to put some anchors with suture attached into the bone of the patella and then we are going to suture the tendon back or sew the tendon back to the level of the uh, patella where it inserts or technique number two we're going to drill some bone tunnels and then we're going to take sutures that we've attached to the tendon and pass them through these bone tunnels and then tie them on the other side of the patella. So you can either use an anchor technique or you can use a bone tunnel technique or you can use a combination of the two if you really want to get fancy. Or staples. This is not a stabling kind of injury. The healing of the tendon bone is going to take about six to eight weeks and during that time usually you're going to be locked in extension. Um, if you have really, really solid repair, you might uh, this uh, pre-position may allow some range of motion during that time, but usually you're going to be locked in extension. So you can imagine after that time period that the leg is going to be stiff, the knee will be will have a decreased range of motion. So then you're going to have to do physiotherapy afterwards to restore the range of motion. And then finally, once you have the range of motion restored, you're going to be weak because you haven't been working out for a long period of time. So you're going to have to do extensive physiotherapy and rehabilitation after that to restore the strength. Upwards of six months of rehab before he's able to even think about getting back to what he was doing before. Yeah, but that's a bad injury. The second that match is over, I'm on the floor just holding on to my leg. It was all right, so we're going to do another old time one. I won't spend too much time on this one because it's similar to the last one. Um, but this one involves Kevin Nash. And so let's see what happens here. Boom. So uh, there we go. So Kevin Nash is a huge, huge man. I, I think he was about six, seven. Huge man. He throws a guy into, into the ropes, kicks that guy. And then he's power stomping over to the corner because not only has he smashed the guy that's in the ring, but he is going to go smash um, the partner of the guy who's waiting to get tagged in. As he does so, you see he takes a big step. And then as he steps, his leg just kind of collapses on him. And um, he starts grabbing at his knee. We can see that his leg still has continuity. The likelihood of there being a fracture is pretty low. Um, but something is going on and he's grabbed the knee. So there is a whole host of things that could have happened here. We've looked this up on media so that we know that he suffered a quad tear, but there are a number of structures that live in and around the knee. And so he could have suffered a injury to his anterior cruciate ligament, posterior cruciate ligament, injury to his MCL or LCL, collateral ligaments, an injury to his meniscus, uh, a cartilage contusion or osteochondral injury um, within the knee itself. If you look at this video, you can see that there's a similarity between this and what happened to Triple H. Basically steps suddenly on his leg while his knee is in quite a high degree of knee flexion. And um, when he does so, he is basically trying to decelerate his body. If you look at muscular contractions, the hardest type of muscle contraction is what's called an eccentric contraction. And this is where the muscle is lengthening um, or getting longer while it's trying to generate force. So basically you are trying to resist the muscle lengthening. And so this is the most difficult type of uh, muscle contraction, such as what has occurred here. So he's planted his leg, the muscle is lengthening, but he is still trying to generate force. He does that, the quadricep gives up the ghost, he falls to the ground, grabs his knee, and as we mentioned with Triple H, 
This is not the type of injury which is going to heal spontaneously or heal in a conservative fashion without surgery. There is a real possibility that after you have this injury, um, your ability to perform at the same level as what you were prior to the injury um, can be reduced. <laughs> so this next one here is uh, Shawn Michaels. So let's see what happens. So Shawn Michaels, boom, gets thrown out of the ring by the Undertaker. But you can see that as he is thrown out, just as he's about to hit the ground, his lower back just kind of bangs or grazes the edge of this platform. You wouldn't necessarily look at this and think, oh, this was quite a severe injury. But when we look at the media report afterwards, we see that he herniated several discs in his lumbar spine. Your spinal column is made up of a number of hard bone vertebrae, and each of those vertebrae are separated by a spongy collection of tissue, which is called a vertebral disc. The spine is able to accommodate a number of movements, forward flexion, rearward flexion, or extension. It could also do side bending, and it can do rotation. And this is because of these discs allow the hard bony parts to move in a number of different ways. The spine is able to tolerate a number of forces that are imparted on it. And in particular, it is able to tolerate a certain degree of compression. When you jump from a height and land on the ground, there is a, a certain amount of compression that occurs through the spine. And basically each of those vertebral bones squishes together uh, onto the discs that are in between those vertebral uh, segments. However, when the force it, that occurs is too high, the vertebral discs will basically herniate or rupture. Think of a Boston cream donut. The vertebral disc has an outer shell which is more rigid, it's kind of rubbery, and inside of the vertebral disc, also rubbery material, but rubber material that is softer and more compliant than the outer shell. So if you squish vertebrae together hard enough, you can cause them either to herniate, which means that some of the filling from the Boston cream donut has been extruded or pushed out through a little slit or rupture in the outer shell. And this means that the vertebral disc is less able to perform its role of shock absorption. Or if the injury is bad enough, not only can you herniate the disc, but you can completely rupture the disc and crush it. So basically, instead of just a little bit of the cream from the Boston Cream Donut can come out, all of it comes out. Report here shows that he herniated two discs and then he has completely ruptured uh, and flattened or crushed one of the vertebral discs, uh, a relatively severe injury. Although this is not something that's going to paralyze him or cause him to lose his ability to walk, it, it's certainly gonna cause him some degree of lower back pain and could result in him having some element of radiculopathy, pain in his lower extremities, because of irritation of the nerve roots at the level of the back. And for those of you who are wondering how do you fix the Boston Cream Donuts, the long and short of it is you don't. What? If you were to look at the spinal column with x-rays, you would see that there is a reduced amount of space between two adjacent vertebrae if there has been an injury to the disc. And that's going to reflect itself by having a decreased ability to absorb shock. It may um, also demonstrate itself by having alterations in your ability to move. Generally, it's going to lead to stress between adjacent vertebral bodies. And over time, that's going to lead to osteoarthritis of your lumbar spine, whatever area of the spine that was involved. And, and then eventually pain. This is usually an injury that occurs from either direct loading of the spinal column or from forward flexion of the spinal cord. You gotta put him in that casket. Michael's at oh. Second last one here, we have uh, Bret Hart, and it looks like he is fighting Goldberg. I think that's Goldberg here. And so Goldberg uh, throws him into the ropes, and then as he throws him into the ropes, uh, or after he rebounds off the ropes, 
He basically gives him a, a side kick to the face. That might cause some problems. Yeah, that, that, boom. Ugh. I, I would venture to guess he had suffered a concussion at the very least, if not some facial fractures. When we look at the media release after this, it shows here that uh, the blow to the, the head that he suffered caused a severe concussion, and I would say no doubt. And this is the type of injury that could have lifelong effects. As a result, he was forced to retire after this. Certainly, if you've had a concussion, let us know in the comments and let us know if you've had any of these symptoms, um, photophobia or light sensitivity, double vision, ringing in your ears, you can have nausea and vomiting, you can have trouble with balance, you, may, you can also have some motor dysfunction. Uh, a, a bad concussion is a very severe injury and problem not only for your health in the future, but also for your ability to remain active in your livelihood. Botched mule kick from Goldberg ultimately brought his professional wrestling career to an end. You know, after he rang my bell, it was always a problem. So this last one here, this one involves Steve Austin. So Steve Austin gets picked up, boom, up. Ah. Basically experiences a pile driver here. And so for those of you who don't know, a pile driver is basically a move where you flip the guy upside down, you're holding his body um, next to yours, but either you drop to your knees or to your buttocks and you drive the other opponent's head directly into the canvas or into the floor or the mat or whatever. Uh, most frequently, the wrestler that was doing the move would drop to his knees so that there's enough distance to protect the other wrestler's head when you drop him to the ground. Because you want to give the appearance that you're dropping his head directly into the ground, but you don't really want to do that because that is a ton of compressive force that you are imparting on the other wrestler's spine. In this particular case, the pile driver was performed where the, the wrestler that was doing it dropped his buttocks. There is not nearly as much distance to protect the other wrestler's head and neck. In the change room afterwards, Steve Austin is kind of laying against the, the wall here on the left hand side of the picture, that there is a, a cervical collar there. After this type of injury, if they're not sure that he suffered a spinal cord injury, or a vertebral fracture involving his cervical spine, they are going to immobilize him in a cervical collar and they will strap him onto a spine board and they will take him to the hospital and they will keep him immobilized in that fashion until they have imaged his cervical spine and his thoracic spine, x-rays, CT scan, and or an MRI to make sure that he has not suffered um, some kind of spinal cord or a vertebral column injury. He did experience a spinal cord injury, however, he was really very, very fortunate because he did not also suffer a vertebral fracture of his cervical spine. Almost certainly if this had been a vertebral fracture, this would have left him as a quadriplegic. And if, had, if it had happened at a high enough level, in other words, between vertebral uh, bodies C3 and C5, this is something that could have caused his death as well. In the end, he did suffer a spinal cord injury, but without radiographic abnormality. And this is something that is known as skiwara. So spinal cord injury without radiographic abnormality, in other words, without a fracture. So basically, through this injury, he bruised his spinal cord, but he did not suffer a uh, a fracture or a, uh, a dislocation or subluxation of his vertebral column. So that's uh, my take on that one. And how much more can So I guess that's a good one to end off on. If you know of any of the, the long-term results from any of these injuries, be sure to let us know in the comments. That's been Dr. Chris reacting to WWE injuries. If you're new to the channel, well, welcome to the Intern Army. <laughs> Be sure to hit the subscribe button and click the notification bell so that you can get notified when we post new content. If you're a returning member of the Intern Army, you know what to do. Like the video and share it with a friend. And as always, that's gonna work from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho. <laughs>